you welcome to the block this is by icor bp or international council of registered blockchain professionals now what is icor bp icor bp is the continuing technical education of altas education which aims to develop relevant skills apply best practices maintain quality and standards and enhance the vital competencies and we do certifications for blockchain and what is this get you it will formalize your blockchain credentials and at the same time establish your credibility as a blockchain professional now this episode we do have a special guest one of the faculties of altash university and at the same time she is a lawyer she's gonna correct me if i am wrong i hope not and this needs further introduction but before that let's go to our sponsors this blockchain continuing education program is brought to you by our major sponsors html coin utility coin beyond the hype altash university your online school in the fourth industrial revolution libra codes take control on your nft creation and credence hub verified credentials anytime anywhere we also would like to thank our partners Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome our guest for today, Miss Desiree Van Ayersel. Did I pronounce it right, Desiree? Yes, Vince, you definitely did. Oh. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. Oh, thank you. Let me say this first. Go after me day. Did I say it right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did. Yes, you did. I'm so thankful for you saying that in my own language. Um, Great. Now, um, before before anything else, let us start uh, about maybe you could talk about yourself, your background and what you do. Of course, of course. Uh, well, my background, as you sort of already spoiled for me, is in law. <laughs> I... <laughs> I uh, obtained a Bachelor of Arts at the University College in the Netherlands. Afterwards, I decided to pursue uh, my interest in the law, which when I started out studying, I could not have imagined I had because it sounded to me incredibly boring studies. Um, but I did find there that the law actually impacts everything, it impacts society, it impacts technology, which is actually also the focus I took while furthering my legal studies where I entered into a, a master's program focused on the regulation and focus on technology and how law and technology actually clash together, but also how they can help each, each other further, uh, which is actually also what I'm currently doing in my job as a legal counsel. Mm -hmm. I work at a research, research institute here in the Netherlands, uh, where I mostly focused on projects relating to uh, IT matters. So everything from the internet to blockchain to everything the, that still sounds kind of scientific, sci-fi mm -hmm. to me, which I think is incredible. And I'm basically uh, the one behind the screens facilitating all the contracting and all the IP registration. Right. Now, how should I address you? Attorney? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> barrister? <laughs> Just my first name would do. I'm not okay. very fond of titles, so uh, please stick with my first name that I'd love. That would be perfect, that's a reason. Now, let's go to our main topic for this evening. Not the regulations, but rather, we're gonna talk about uh, your blockchain journey. So how did you, did you start your blockchain journey? <laughs> well, I actually must say, I still think I'm very much on my blockchain journey. Uh, I started out a few years ago, actually, when I was reading in the newspaper all this stuff about uh, the Bitcoin course going up and down and up and down. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking that I had no clue what all these concepts meant and actually how I should encapsulate and properly understand what Bitcoin actually was, what blockchain actually was. And I had that feeling over the course of a few months time, because every single day I'd read an article on the topic. Mm -hmm. And I find out that I didn't really know much about it. And it's one of my uh, personality traits to not really like not knowing anything about a specific topic. So what I do, of course, is go and research it. 
especially something for basically my generation is uh, when I don't know anything, I'm going to Google it, which is what I did whenever I came across a term in one of those newspaper articles to figure out what it actually meant. And I actually hoped that it somehow would stick into the recesses of my brain, but it never actually got there. Mm. So every single time I tried to understand and I didn't come much further than the day before. Uh, so I decided, because I was annoyed, to take up a blockchain course at my university, which is quite nearby my hometown. So I figured I would do a course uh, and try to find one that sort of uh, combines my focus on the law plus blockchain, which I did. I found a wonderful course at Utrecht University uh, where they actually uh, introduced me to uh, blockchain plus IP law, also blockchain plus competition law, and just mm. basically laid out the foundation of the blockchain sphere and actually cleared up all these, for me, fuzzy terms. And that sort of got me thinking that I really enjoyed looking into this new technology. And that's basically how I started, just as somebody who was slightly annoyed because she didn't understand what she read. <laughs> <laughs> and now I've actually made it my, my core focus of research. Oh, now for for our audience, when you say IP, you mean intellectual property rights? Yes, everything right? relating to copyrights, mm. patents, trademarks, everything like that. And there's of course a very big component on which you can register, for instance, your uh, copyright on this mm. wonderful piece of art that you've created on a blockchain. So you can say, hey, this is my painting and not yours, and I've made it before you started to claim it. So you can actually make sure that you can exercise your rights. You can do that via blockchain, which is pretty mm -hmm. cool. Now, um, con thinking about blockchain, any specific areas of con concentration that you are currently working on right now? Well, I've actually quite recently finished an article uh, on the regulation of stable coins in the U EU and in the USA. Uh, of course, stablecoins is kind of a hot topic, especially since the collapse of Terra and Luna. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've mostly focused on the regulation of something as big as Tether. Um, and I've actually tried to analyze uh, the proposals that have come out of the EU and out of the US to mm -hmm. regulate uh, the crypto sphere and more specifically stablecoins. Because, of course, regulators got sort of scared when Facebook announced Libra a few years ago. I know. They were suddenly jilted into thinking, oh, God, we need to do something with this. Mm -hmm. And um, they really actively try to regulate uh, the all the crypto assets we have around us in uh, at this, this day, day and age. Um, and I assessed whether these proposals that they put forward after being so scared of something like Libra coming up, if that actually sort of struck the right balance between the protecting the consumer or the investor who mm -hmm. uses or makes use of uh, crypto and actually still allows innovation in the sphere. Because if you would like amp on the uh, consumer protection side way too much, you would sort of decrease all the innovation that can go on and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be a proper balance between the two. And I've recently wrote an article and published it in Cambridge Law Review uh, on this topic. And spoiler, both uh, sides, uh, both countries across the pond actually have not really managed to strike a proper balance between innovation and consumer protection. And I've actually uh, jilted too much to the side of consumer protection, mm -hmm. which is dangerous to innovation in this sphere. And it's such a wonderful sphere. I don't know if you'll answer this. It's This is out of uh, the list of our questions, but let me... Give me your thoughts. I don't know. It's okay if you're going to answer it or not. Your thoughts on XRP and SEC here in the States. My gosh. I'm not really sure if I'm the most qualified person to answer something. <laughs> okay. Somebody on the, on the, on the States, as, if, as, as I am an EU-based um, legal professional, and I would never, ever want to jilt all the uh, U.S. professionals that are probably in the audience right now. So I think <laughs> that question would be better suited to sort of my counterpart situated in the U.S. Okay, fair enough. Sorry about that. I, it just drew, I, I, it, It's just right there and I cannot stop. I, but <laughs> you know how it is with Terra Luna. It has been a disaster for for the stable coins and 
with them. I see the founder being threatened in his house and all the all of those things. So I see where you are at in terms of consumer protection. And uh, regarding the project that you're currently working on, you already worked with, maybe you could share to us where the article is, where, where can they read it, or which website, or of which course. magazine? Of course, you can find it online via Cambridge Law Review. It's in volume seven. Um, so it's quite easily accessible. Just Google Cambridge Law Review, and it's an, a purely open access and online journal. Okay. Um, so everybody interested in reading something about the regulation mm -hmm. of stable coins is welcome to do so. Um, and you can find my article there. There are so many wonderful articles already on the topic. Also by uh, a professor called Zetche. I think he's from Frankfurt. I'm not mm -hmm. exactly 100% sure where he is from, but he is German. His, his article is also brilliant uh, on the regulation in Europe. So that would also be a big recommendation for, uh, from my side. Uh, including also the work of Marco Dallerba, also a wonderful professor in this field. Okay, I'll be asking all of those um, links later Perfect. on so that I could add up on the description box so that, you know, if our audience will be looking for it, it'll be easier for them. By the way, we have here, she is my co-host, but she's one of the best moms other than being one of the women in blockchain taking care of her kids graduation day or recognition day so that's dr tammy francis saying uh giving a shout out to both of us especially to you desiree our guest for today so that's dr tammy francis here now um this is another question that uh i don't know how 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 i would approach this but um you did talk, you have those articles published this would be uh, is it already pub it's already out there am i correct yes since it's last month actually since last month now going back to uh, your profession and blockchain can you be more uh, specific for our audience in terms of uh what would be the problems or world problems that blockchain maybe can solve in terms of your practice any any use cases that you can cite on in terms of my practice do you mean specifically my research field or do you mean my my, my day as, job so to speak? yeah practice as a lawyer <laughs> my uh well actually it can uh my my my, my practice as legal counsel is actually very broad since it is focused on everything ICT related. Um, and there is a lot of work done in the field of blockchain, of course, in, IC, in, in ICT land, so to speak. Uh, and also if you would connect that to a legal field, of course, the practice of the notary could be um, sped up and could mm. be more cost efficient if you would implement a blockchain in this system. Of course, a notary is, uh, has it as its core function to make sure that the house you're actually buying from this one person was actually owned by this one person mm -hmm. who has all the rights to trans to be and is able to transfer all of them to you as a new land and house owner. Um, if you would have a registry on a blockchain that shows who owns what house and what land, um, then you could much easily, much more easily, and much quicker also transfer deeds of ownership, know mm. who, who owns what. So it's much easier also from a government point of view to keep track of things, uh, also for landowners to keep track of things, and also just to make sure that you are actually buying a house from the right person, which is generally a notary's job to make sure that that actually happens. And But it costs a small fortune, of course, to hire a notary, and right. this just speeds it up, makes it more, uh, makes it cheaper, makes it faster, and is generally just, I think, a very good example of how the legal field could also, and can actually benefit from blockchain. Um, another point, of course, is art. Art, like I, I think I mentioned it before, of course, but registration of IP rights mm -hmm. is in my field of practice and also my focus on IP. It's actually kind of kind of core because you need to make sure that you register as an IP owner 
uh, the rights to, uh, for instance, your painting or your book or your manuscript or whatever you wrote, and to make sure that you can still claim this, uh, claim it as yours. I know there are some differences in how copyrights are, for instance, claimed or registered compared to when comparing the EU to the US. Mm -hmm. The EU does not have a, an active registration of copyright, which sometimes makes it incredibly difficult to figure oh. out who came up with what. Right. Um, but if you would regi register this stuff on a blockchain, it would be much easier and there would be way less legal battles to fight over what, who owns what and who painted what. Uh, or, for instance, who made this one tune that um, a video company would use or this introductory tune, to, for instance, um, mm -hmm. uh, a wonderful show like today. Um, you could register stuff like that on a blockchain and that's mm -hmm. just brilliant. Or you could just collaborate on art on a blockchain. And that also would facilitate working together, but it would also facilitate basically my job. Mm -hmm. um, and gain us, get, give also the legal professionals more insight into who owns what, which is of course what legal professionals really live for, who owns what, uh, where does what go, and uh, what contracts did who sign, basically. Right, right, right. I, I'm so interested with the notarization because that's the other challenge, having things notarized and you have to look for a notary public who's going to do all those stuff and then the authentication despite of the notarization and it, it uh it's kind of there's a lot of bureaucracy on the papers so yes. once it's done on blockchain i mean that solves a lot of problems so how does and, and, and in addition to that you were talking about art and with the nfts grow growing right now that's one thing where really blockchain could really help um going back to uh my my train of thought right now is like i got several questions that i don't <laughs> i don't know which one to start with anyway let me go back to my list which is what is your advice for people who wants to become a blockchain professional advocate like you first of all get um your courses and get your certifications that's what i would recommend because learning from blockchain professionals in the field is such an amazing opportunity to really connect also to the wonderful blockchain sphere to the professionals around you and also really just gain insight into concepts that you have googled like i did a hundred times but still somehow don't really see the depth of or the complexity of but also gives you a chance to really consider the application of blockchain in ways in which uh, you cannot comprehend uh, by just Googling stuff like mm -hmm. I did. So get your certification, take your courses, but really mostly connect with all the wonderful professionals around you. It's been such a thrill to actually see all these wonderful professionals also reach out to me via LinkedIn and say, hey, you're also part of this funny little community that we're building that's growing exponentially every single day with new additions to our blockchain sphere. Let's keep in touch. And that's just amazing because you can bounce ideas off of one another. You can enter into collaborations you've never thought of before, or you can even uh, surprise yourself by um, actually coming up with something wonderful in the blockchain sphere and making it, for instance, like I did, your main field of research. Where do you see blockchain in your practice five years from now my gosh i think the legal field has um <laughs> it's 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 a dusty and slightly traditional field generally speaking mm -hmm. uh usually legal professionals are kind of scared about innovation um so <laughs> perhaps this is going to make you laugh but um i think in the beginning of this year uh dutch courts actually uh, stopped using the fax machines and just switch over to the internet completely, which was a shocker to me that they still used fax oh, machines really? that often. Yes, I'm not kidding. Wow. And the reports are actually very excellent. They're extremely good. There's no point against them. But mm -hmm. the fact that you could still send in stuff by a fax to me was just amazing. bizarre. <laughs> amazing. It's amazing. So I honestly hope that in five years' time, the legal professionals have sort of woken up 
and started to think, hey, we need to educate ourselves about blockchain and we need to educate ourselves on the 100 wonderful innovations that have come out of blockchain and have developed onto the blockchain sphere by that time. So that's honestly where I hope the legal professional, profession, professionals are going to be by that time, which is sort of a sad analysis. But I think if I go back to my facts example, I think it's, it's slightly accurate, unfortunately. I remember I had a case back in the Philippines and they were sending me the uh, subpoena and I got my lawyer there and everything. And they want everything to be signed uh, like, you know, sign through copy, it's original. I said, hey, is there a way that you can do a doctor sign? Because that's, that's how we make it, like, really fast. But the courts would not accept doctor sign. Rather, they have to mail everything here in the <laughs> States, <laughs> have it signed, and then mail back, which takes a lot of time. So that's that's the legal system there. And I thought that's only on third world countries, but amazing fax machine. Gosh, no. Gosh, no. I mean, there are still some people who are kind of iffy about the use of DocuSign in an L. Unfortunately, a lot of people are getting getting onto that bandwagon. They actually really are using DocuSign a lot more. Courts are mm. accept, accepting e-signatures much more. Um, we have actually a lot of, uh, we have a specific sector uh, of one of our reports that deals mm -hmm. with matters of patents but also ICT related questions and our judges are actually educating themselves a lot on these matters but still you see that the legal system is mm -hmm. an old timesy system and it takes a while to really rise in the ranks become a judge for instance mm -hmm. and generally it's the uh, people who are really like who really have their, their feet right in the middle of innovation that are able to actually apply it to their, their daily practice and their day-to-day -day business. Um, and generally you see sometimes uh, that when people grow more comfortable in a specific role, that they are not mm -hmm. as, as willing to take up something completely new or completely uh, scary sometimes even. Yeah, so I yeah. think the human side of it also plays a big part. I, I, I agree. Uh, we have old timers, 60 years old, who are even afraid to touch iPad or use the, <laughs> the, the, the mobile phone. Now, last question, maybe second to the last. You did. You already answered this, but I would rather hear you expound more on the, on on this question. Is having a formal training and certification on blockchain important? And what are your thoughts on that? I, I know you already talked about it. Make you maybe you could uh, expound more on your thoughts on you know really having a certification for blockchain. Of course, I think it would actually be a wonderful and excellent starting point for everybody's career to have one type of blockchain certification that you can get. Basically, just like one can have a bachelor's of art uh, and obtain it in the Netherlands, and it would still be a bachelor of art when you would consider it in the US, I think it would be good to have one system of certification on blockchain in the entire world at some point, because that would show everybody that you know what you're talking about and that you have really gone through the trouble to, uh, and the time actually, to allow yourself to really be um, swallowed up by that space and really allow your thought process to really access the, the wonderful world of blockchain and actually really gain knowledge on the concept. Because otherwise, basically everybody could say, I'm a blockchain expert. I know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. can do a job related to blockchain. I could um, be, be a programmer on blockchain or I could become a, a, a legal professional who is focused on blockchain. And I think one certification for everybody not a one size fits all, fits all, but one specific line of certifications with specializations in there uh, relating to your field of practice or related to your focus could actually be incredibly beneficial to make sure that every professional is actually do, able to do a proper job and is able to really put all those wonderful concepts into practice. Thank you so much, Desiree. This is a very fruitful conversation. I learned a lot. And 
maybe your final thoughts or you know for millennials they would say oh you want to give a shout out to whoever (laughs) (laughs) i'll give the full frame to you invite them to your article or where you write so (laughs) i'll give the whole frame go ahead well, Vince, I mostly want to thank you for uh, for hosting this wonderful show. And I, of course, want to shout out to Amando, who organizes a lot of stuff also behind the scenes for Altash University. He is a rock star, really. So I think that's my shout out. And I also would like to like uh, throw a quick wave to Dr. Francis, who's also been wonderful. Desiree, legal counsel from Netherlands. Thank you so much. God bless you. Take care. This is Vince from The Block signing out. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. This blockchain continuing education program is brought to you by our major sponsors. HTML Coin, Utility Coin Beyond the Hype. Altash University, your online school in the fourth industrial revolution. Libra Codes, take control on your NFT creation. And Credence Hub. All right, everybody. Hopefully you enjoyed today's lesson. And if you did enjoy the lesson, do me a favor. Hit the like button below, share it with your friends, and subscribe to the channel. Oh, and by the way, check down below in the description. There's a link on how you can get my latest book, Training Part-Time, completely for free. Don't forget to take a look at my next video coming up right there. We know you'll enjoy it. All right, everybody. We'll see you in the next video lesson.